great kickoff to uh, this first retreat we're going to do together. Um, for those of you that I haven't had a chance to personally meet, except through emails and stuff, my name's Dave Mayer. I'm sort of the new kid on the block, so to speak. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, one of the things we're trying to do with this is to bring everybody together um, from safety, quality, risk management, as you'll, if you've seen already, but if you haven't, you're going to continue to see it. Um, Larry Smith and I are, are pretty much joined together in a lot of this work. The, the days of safety, quality, and, and risk management being separated, very similar to the way physicians, nurses, and pharmacists have been historically, it has broken down. And, and it's a new world in safety, quality, and risk management, and, and there's new agendas, new things. We've learned that if we work together, we could accomplish and do some great stuff. We're all trying to row in the same direction. We're all trying to accomplish the same goals. And I could say from a, my own personal standpoint, from being in safety and quality for many years, um, it's an exciting field to be into today. Um, for many years, no one was interested. No one seemed to care. But that clearly changed 10 years ago, and it's escalating on a regular basis. So there's a lot of great things that um, we've accomplished and the great things you've accomplished through the last few years. And we want to keep that momentum going. And we want to do it as a system. We want to do it together. We want to share best practices. And one of the reasons I came here, and I know it resonates with many of you, is because we believe we could be the best in quality and safety as a system um, compared to others across the country. I've seen others across the country, and some of them are doing great things. A lot of them are continuing to struggle on how to do it. And so I think we're in a great position to, to move this forward. Our, our goals with the retreat, as I was starting to say, are first to get us together on a quarterly basis and to engage in different domains, different topics that we believe are important in achieving our, our mission of good to great. Um, I won't get into a whole lot of Rosemary Gibson's background. You've got her bio um, in your packet, so hopefully you've had a chance to read about her accomplishments. I, I will emphasize and, and state, you know, when it comes to palliative care, when it comes to medical errors and patient safety, when it comes to overuse in health care, when it comes to health care reform, Rosemary has been at the leader position in all these efforts. She's written books on them. She's been in front of congressional hearings. She's literally changed how palliative care was done in the 90s with a lot of work she did and, and raising the urgency to make care better. So this has been her career. This has been what she's been dedicated to is making care safer, higher quality, better value, um, and protecting patients. When she published the book, uh, Wall of Silence, we, I, I got a copy of it because I heard it was coming out from some friends and, and read it literally in about two, three days. And for those of you who haven't read it, I encourage you to, to pick it up. It, it's a great story. It's a story of about 75 patients and family members who were unintentionally harmed by our care. Good people trying to do good work, but the patients ended up getting hurt from caregivers who were trying to provide healing to them. And where, while the book didn't focus on the errors per se, or the reason the system, the process, the, the care didn't live up to its standards, it focused in on what happens after harm occurs. And, and the title, Wall of Silence, I think greatly describes that wall that comes up historically between us as caregivers and our patients and families. In fact, that wall comes up between fellow caregivers, where we don't want to talk about these things. We, we, sort of turn it over historically to others to manage. And we left the patients with essentially a second harm, and sometimes a worse harm than the original harm. Without more of me, I will introduce Rosemary Gibson. Uh, as Dave mentioned, I'm here today because about um, oh, t 10 years ago, um, my husband and I were sitting at the kitchen table one night and we were doing the dishes and cleaning up and he said, you know, um, just out of the blue, he said, you need to write a book. And I have a wonderful husband and he said, um, I said, okay, you know, what should I write about? And he said, well, um, you'll figure it out. You'll come up with something. So at the time I was working at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in Princeton, New Jersey. And I'll tell you a little bit this morning about that work. 
And I came across the Institute of Medicine report to Air is Human. It had just come out. And I said to myself, if we're going to change this, we need to know who these people are and what happens and drill down to understand it and to make them part of the conversation. And um, for the past 10 years, it's been my honor and privilege to, to use this stimulus of the patient experience and also the experience of physicians and nurses when adverse events occur to help trigger improvement and reform. First, I'd like to um, talk to you about sort of my own personal journey on what is it that got me into understanding the role of the patient experience and how transformative it can be in the work that we do. For those of you who are clinicians, how many of you are cl clinicians? <clears throat> you know that patients are sometimes your best teachers. <laughs> they teach you about illness, about disease, its course, its treatment, and they teach you about our humanity. Um, I'd like to give, a, at a different level, a, a brief case example of how the patient's perspective can make a difference at a higher level where I was working at a philanthropic organization in the work of palliative care and building the field of palliative medicine. Then I want to trans and I know Georgetown has a palliative care program. Are there other uh, facilities in MedStar that have palliative care? It's great. And then I'd like to d define what is this patient perspective on patient safety? What can we learn? So finally, I'd like to identify what can be the contributions of patients to patient safety, because I know you're on this journey, you have been, and you want to go more deeply into it. And I hope that this conversation will sort of inspire you even more. So part one, a case example of patient perspectives and how they can make a difference. For about 16 years, I worked at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in Princeton, New Jersey. And in uh, 1995, uh, we had, um, for many years, been funding a study called SUPPORT that was tracing the care of seriously ill patients in intensive care units in a number of teaching hospitals around the country. And the findings came out and were published in JAMA that year, in November, I'll never forget it. And it showed that despite a $30 million study and the efforts of clinicians from around the country, physicians, nurses, who are caring for seriously ill patients in the ICU, trying to provide good care for many of them who were towards the end of their life. That the results, it was a negative study. That so much of what was being done to try to make care better for seriously ill patients was not working. And I'll never forget, I was watching the evening news that night, and Peter Jennings actually reported on this study, you know how JAMA does a good job on Wednesdays of getting their stories out in the nightly news. Well, Peter Jennings was reporting on this story, and who knew 15 years later that he would benefit from palliative care that would come from the results of this support study. So um, what the support study found is that many patients spent the last weeks and months of their lives tethered to machines in pain, their DNR status not known, their preferences and values were unknown. And so I remember a group from the foundation went to the AMA and said, you know, we wanted to let you know that this study is coming out, and it's a negative study, and you should just be prepared for it. <clears throat> I had just uh, come to the foundation two years prior, and I'm not a researcher, I'm not a clinician, but I said, what can we do to improve that patient experience? What can we do to improve care for people with, with serious illness? Here was the uh, JAMA study. This made, had 1,500 uh, news articles uh, the following day in newspapers around the country. It was so, so profound. So a good part of this study is that in addition to the data, looking at outcomes, it was also a series of narratives. Interviews were done in the course of the study of physicians, of nurses, and of patients and their family members to understand what's really going on here. And it was through those narratives of the clinicians and the patients that we began to understand what might be going on here. We learned that um, patients with serious illness, that they were not receiving the care that they wanted, that their preferences and values were not being known, let alone followed. And there was a designated intervention to try to change that, and it didn't work. So what could we do differently? Some of you might remember back to the mid-1990s. This is when states such as Oregon were 
voting on uh, provisions to legalize physician-assisted suicide. I just heard the other day that Massachusetts has a bill just recently um, that's uh, going to be on a ballot. And some of you might remember, this was a real shot in the arm for me when 60 Minutes aired this segment of Dr. Jack Kevorkian assisting in the death of a patient. And I was particularly sensitive to this. Uh, the patient had ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. My father had died of Lou Gehrig's disease. And I thought, oh my God, he was a patient who clearly was suffering and was not getting the care and the concern and the support he needed. And he was ending up doing this. Sometimes the worst things have a silver lining. And these events were a wake-up call they were a wake-up call to society, to the profession of medicine, and to the healthcare establishment. So it was clear that we needed something to do better. And at the foundation, there's no way that we could have created an environment of urgency than what the media and the public had already created for us. And so we took advantage of that opportunity. And the good news is there were many physicians from around the country, many nurses, many leaders in healthcare that said, let's come together. So while we were at the foundation, we made, over the course of the next 15 years, more than $200 million in grants to change how we provide care at the end of life. And one of the first things that happened was uh, the AMA, the Board of Trustees, all completed their own advanced directives. It was part of their, part of their process of getting on board. Let's fast forward to where we are now. Many years later, palliative care now is part of the mainstream of healthcare. We started with educating physicians and nurses on the basics. There was a body of knowledge that was built that was put together through different courses in medical schools, education and training. We put content on licensing exams. We put content in medical and nursing textbooks. You know, 15 years ago, if you picked up a medical or nursing textbook, you would never know that a patient ever died. And so if you didn't have the study of the fact that people died, how do we care for them? You know, to become a physician, our physician colleagues would tell us to become a physician, you had to demonstrate competence in bringing a person into the world. But what kind of competence do we have to demonstrate in showing that we can help people leave this world? There was this imbalance. And the same in nursing. But again, the good news, all these good, you know, Mahatma Gandhi once said, whenever there's a good cause, people just popped up. Oh, people just popped up. And so these were sort of lines in the sand, the Oxford textbook of palliative medicine, the Oxford textbook of palliative nursing, and we have subsequent editions that have come out, so here we are. But where did it all start? It started from and was motivated by the experience of the patient and many patients collectively that created the urgency for us to say, how can we do it better? And I'm happy to say through some work that the foundation funded I designed and led our $200 million effort at the foundation. Now there's more than 1,600 hospitals that have something called palliative care programs. They're at various stages of development. Some are very robust. Others are just trying to get started. It's now palliative medicine is an ABMS recognized specialty. And we set up a group called the Center to Advance Palliative Care to help hospitals set up palliative care programs. They're moving into nursing homes, into outpatient settings which is really a good thing to do. But once again, where did it all come from? It started from the engagement of patients and families. You know what's interesting about the Medicare hospice benefit? It's the only part of Medicare that was designed with the engagement of patients and families along with clinicians. Really interesting. And by the way, one of the most extraordinary things that I learned from doing this work was how meaningful the work became for physicians and nurses and others because they could practice medicine and nursing in the way that they wanted to. It's what drew them into these prof healing professions. We're bringing actually more joy in the workplace when we get it right, when we are honoring patients' preferences and values, when we can manage their symptoms, and when we actually have time for dialogue. It's we were creating the opportunity for people to do meaningful work in their day-to-day -day professional lives. And, you know, patients are our teachers in many other contexts. When I was preparing this presentation, I did a quick literature review, and there's wonderful literature on the role of patients as teachers 
And perhaps you've experienced that in your own training, no doubt about it. There was a reference in the nursing literature about engaging patients in classroom training and the positive impact it had. More recently here, I found this at the University of Michigan. They actually have a course that all medical students have to take called Family-Centered Experience. And they're actually advertising on their website for patients to come in and teach in the medical school. Isn't that interesting? They're doing that now. And the aim is to see the patient as a whole person and help students better understand not just that encounter, but the patient in their life. And here's a, a great quote from the coordinator of the program. The experience of delving deeper into the non-clinical aspects of disease and the patient, patient experience helps aspiring doctors learn the platinum rule to treat people as they themselves want to be treated. Isn't that great? So then the thought came to my mind, what can patients teach us about patient safety? Can the experience of delving deeper into the non-clinical aspects of care when adverse events occur help doctors, nurses, hospital administrators, and others learn the platinum rule to treat people as they themselves want to be treated? Is there a role for bringing patients and families into that conversation? And if so, what is it? I'd like to transition now to what is the patient perspective on patient safety? As Dave mentioned, I wrote this book, The Wall of Silence, and just so you know, we donate proceeds to patient groups because they're the ones who taught us so much. They're the ones that made it possible. And when this uh, manuscript was done in 2002, I had it ready to go. And you know, I was afraid to, to mail it out to anybody. And I even had friends, you know, physicians and nurses, people I worked with. But you know, we didn't talk about those things back then. What is the patient experience of harm? So I came home from work one day and my, we were sitting around at dinner. My husband said, well, did you send it out? And I said, no. He said, well, by tomorrow it better be out. So I started sending it out to really, I kept it close to the best, to close friends. They gave me some feedback. They said, go ahead, go ahead, keep going. Don't change it. And then they had um, the publisher put on the um, by the tagline, the untold story of the medical mistakes that kill and injure millions of Americans, and I was mortified. I was absolutely, my husband said, leave it. And if you look back over 10 years since the IOM report, if you add up if it's 100,000 deaths every year from errors, right? And 100,000 deaths from hospital acquired infections from CDC day. It's 200,000 people a year, right? Over the course of a decade, that's a lot of people, isn't it? What can patients, patients teach us? How many of you have ever actually seen the Two Errors Human book? I don't know about you, when I saw that, I thought it was one of the most compelling pieces of literature for its honesty and forthrightness. It acknowledged how much good people do in healthcare every single day, how much good you do every single day. And most of the time, you get it right. And people are alive today, they go home. It's amazing. In the past month, I've had uh, three people tell me about perfect care that they received under extreme circumstances. And if they didn't have it, they'd be dead. But they are alive today because of what medicine and nursing was able to do. And while we have that, we also have these other pockets where things don't go well. And is there a better way that we can fix these systems to prevent adverse events from happening? And when they do happen, find a better way to respond. So yes, the first, I think it's probably the first acknowledgement in the history of medicine that we do so much good, but yes, we do harm people. I love this quote from Einstein, if I can't picture it, I can't understand it. So when I saw the IOM report, I said to myself, yeah, we've got to find out who these people are. And the publisher said, yeah, you really should talk to some real people, not just look at the literature and so on. This was back in 2002, and I said to myself, my god, where am I going to find these people? Because nobody talked about this sort of thing. So I went to Google, and I Googled medical error victim. And the first thing that came up 
And this tells me that all of this enterprise we are engaged in was meant to be. The first thing that came up was a meeting that was being held at a church in the town next to the one where I grew up. And I said to myself, it's time for me to go home and see, visit my mother and meet the people who are doing this work. So I called up the pastor of the church. He put me in touch with a woman who was organizing these events. And that was the beginning of my journey of understanding the extraordinary power that the patients and their families have in making care safer for us all. Michael Deaver, who was Ronald Reagan's communications advisor, had this great quote, data persuade, emotion motivates. I'll never forget the chief nursing officer of a hospital in Florida came up to me once and she said, you know what we do at our hospital? Whenever there is an event that happens and it goes up the line, we send that information up, but we also send a picture and a short bio of that patient with that other information to let people know who this person person was, this grandmother, this grandfather, the son, the daughter, to remind us. This is very powerful stuff and very hard stuff because we don't, we don't want to come into work and have any of this happen, but it does. And it takes a lot of courage to go there and look. And for years and years and years, the term wall of silence came from patients who said, you know, all these things are swept under the rug because it can be so hard for us to face them. And how do we help each other face them and make it better? This was um, a little boy whose mother was the first person I met on this journey. Um, his name is Michael Corina. He's very cute in a sailor suit. Michael went into the hospital to have his tonsils taken out. The surgery went fine. He went home. His mother took off a week from work to be with her son. She worked in the post office in Long Island. There was, had been bleeding around his gums in the course of the following week. She went back to different doctors, and one time an urgent care center. The point is there was not continuity of care in that outpatient world. He had been vomiting blood from time to time. When she went back to work on the eighth day after the surgery, she got a call from the babysitter. And she said, once again, Michael was vomiting blood. The babysitter called 911. The ambulance came. His mother came home. And he died eventually, about 24 hours later. That was then. What happens in the aftermath? I met this mother at this uh, church on Long Island, and I said to her, um, why did you sue? And she said there were two reasons. She said it was the only way I could find out why my son died. Because nobody would talk to her. And the second reason, she said, was, this was so extraordinary. She said, I had to know it wasn't my fault. I had to know that I was a good mother, that I had done everything possible to save my son's life. She desperately, for her own survival, needed answers to these questions. And when these events happen, you know, these parents often wonder why they're still on this earth and whether they should remain on this earth, because they feel guilty. They feel as if they didn't do their job. It is a terrible burden that we put on patients when there are these types of adverse events. So how do we turn this poison into medicine? His mom now serves as the public member on the board of the Joint Commission. She started the Nassau County and Long Island Patient Safety Council, working with hospitals in her community. She's a frequent speaker at hospitals. She goes to high schools talking about the importance of infection control, what to do when you go visit a family member or friend in the hospital. So we have these people who are popping up. They're rare. They're not everybody, but they're a small segment. And they, want, they have to take their experience and turn it into something for good in a really constructive way. Uh, Lewis Blackman was a 15-year-old boy who um, went for surgery, elective surgery, for pectus excavatum. 
He was a subject of a film that Dr. Mayer did uh, at the University of Illinois Chicago that was sent to be used in medical schools around the country. <coughs> it was the first time I came across the term failure to rescue. It turns out there was a, there's a literature about failure to rescue, documenting when patients you know, deteriorate while they're in the hospital and their clinical signs and symptoms are missed. This is what happened to Lewis. And 96 hours after a surgery that went reasonably well, uh, he died of a blood loss from a perforated ulcer attributed to a particular drug, Toradol. The good people taking care of him missed these signs and symptoms. His mother kept asking for help. She tried to go up the hierarchy. Help did not come, and he succumbed. And today, he'd probably be graduating from medical school. That was then, and this is now. His mother, Helen Haskell, founded a, a group called Mothers Against Medical Error. She's not some outsized radical. She's a, an archaeologist by training. She a, brings a scientific mind to the work of patient safety. She now serves on the board of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement as a public member. She's worked with hospitals in South Carolina to bring disclosure and transparency when adverse events occur in their practices, and many, many other things that are too much to name. She's, writing, she's written chapters with articles with Dave. She's writing a, co-editing a book on patient experience of adverse events and what to do. Again, these are not common people, but there are these kind of people out there who are, can be part of the journey and are part of the journey to join with healthcare professionals to make healthcare better and safer for us all. And we'll come back to this um, failure to rescue issue and the role of patients and families in helping to shape the course of the implementation of rapid response systems. Erin Flatley is a beautiful young woman who went for surgery for hemorrhoids at a hospital in Florida. Uh, her dad is a retired dentist. She went home from the hospital. She developed a fever. She went back to the hospital. You know where this is going. Her dad kept asking for help. He said, I've never known that a person could have a heart rate that high that his daughter had and still be alive. Help did not come in time, and she ended up dying of sepsis. That was then, and this is now. Her dad started this sepsis alliance to create public awareness and awareness among physicians and nurses about sepsis and its signs and symptoms. He's raised money to bring this content into nursing education and in other venues. So these are the kind of people that are out there that are just literally dying to make a contribution, to work, to partner with healthcare professionals in a constructive way, to work together. I'd like to talk some more about patient and family members' contributions um, to patient safety. So just to sum up, patient and family members have been invited. We're seeing more and more of this in hospitals around the country. They're being invited in to partner with healthcare professionals to figure out how can we make care better, to understand what it is that causes events, to participate in root cause analyses, and even in some institutions, I know this was true at UIC, to be part of monthly patient safety meetings where cases are examined, not the own case that they're involved in, but in the cases of other patients and families. And one of the benefits that they bring is that oftentimes you know that there's a wall of silence within, sometimes within our professions, it's hard to say things. The public, and I find myself in this situation, I gave a talk recently at the National Summit on Overuse sponsored by the Joint Commission and the AMA. I'm in the position of being able to say things that I know healthcare professionals want to say, but they cannot say because of the norms of their situation. And then what we do is we open up the conversation to allow others maybe to, to join in with us. Patients have taught us what to do when harm occurs. And there's a, a growing and robust literature on what we should do when harm occurs. I inter when I interviewed patients and families for a wall of silence, there was a consistent pattern of what those who were harmed wanted. They wanted to be told the truth. Tell me what happened. They want to know why it happened. 
if they're ailing from the consequences of the harm, they want to know that they'll be taken care of. It's what I call the benevolent gestures. Do we do the right thing when we harm people? And they also, they really want to make sure that when bad things happen, that we're working hard to prevent them from happening to someone else. They want to know that some good will come of what happens. One of the things that um, I wrote about in Wall of Silence were these patient and family wishes. Since then, as I mentioned, there has been a literature. But what's been so wonderful is that there's been growing practices among a number of progressive hospitals and other healthcare organizations to begin to tell patients and families honestly and openly that yes, harm has occurred, here's what happened and why, we're committed to investigating to really understand it, and then to make amends. University of Michigan was one of the first out of the gate, University of Illinois Chicago, Children's Hospital of Minneapolis, and in many of these places they have seen their malpractice claims and premiums decline by being open, honest, and transparent. The thing that, you know, that I learned was, and I know patients learned also, some of them over time, some of the leaders. On the one hand, we wanted the healthcare system and the people in it to be honest when harm occurs. We wonder, why isn't that happening? But then by partnering with physicians and nurses who are trying to make it better, there was a realization that honesty inside healthcare won't happen without making caregivers feel safe. Really, really important. Both have to happen to achieve the outcomes of higher levels of safety. Now, there's two examples that I've had experience with at the Johnson Foundation as we migrated you know, from palliative care, then I moved into patient safety, um, was the role of patients and families in creating the urgency for rapid response systems and also the work to reduce hospital-acquired infections. I presume all of you have rapid response systems in place? You know, we all learn about these events uh, from different ways. This is a woman whose uh, daughter I met. Uh, her name is Marion Hart. Uh, she had a daughter who's uh, a nurse. And I'll never forget when I was writing Wall of Silence, sitting on the couch in my home, listening to her daughter tell about her experience of her mother, Marion Hart. She had just been diagnosed with cancer. She had gone into the hospital for certain tests. And for some unknown reason, she was prescribed morphine by a resident. And yet she reported no pain. Over the course of time, to make a long story short, she ended up getting an overdose of morphine. And her daughter, a nurse, kept asking for help, trying to call attention to the fact that her mother was suffering the obvious signs of respiratory depression, losing consciousness. And to make a long story short, her mother ended up dying from the morphine overdose. And this is an extraordinary quote from the daughter, who was beyond despair because she watched she said, I actually thought of calling 911 from my mother's hospital room. I regret to this day I didn't do it. Think of that. And she's a nurse. It was one of the most powerful conversations I've ever had. And most, I'll never forget it all of my life, this daughter, in such excruciating pain. And after that call, I said to myself, heaven help us. Let's see if we can find a solution to this. A few years later, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement found some literature in the Australian medical literature of what we now call rapid response systems. It was because of what patients taught me that while I was at the Johnson Foundation, we actually supported hundreds of hospitals in their efforts to establish rapid response systems. That grant making happened because it was what patients taught me. I was just at Children's Hospital of Alabama a couple months ago doing medical rounds, and the quality and safety staff were so happy to report they've had a 75% reduction in the number of codes at their institution. 
you could see the joy in their faces. And that's the beauty of this work. We can actually bring back the joy and meaning by taking the things out that none of us want to see happen. This was the sign that they used in Vanderbilt Hospital for their rapid response team. There was a, a study we had commissioned about the role of rapid response systems and there's a wonderful quote from a med surge nurse who said, before when a patient was deteriorating, it was like being thrown to the wolves. And what changed? We put a system in place with a protocol. In many places, it still doesn't work perfectly, but it's better than in most places than what the situation used to be. We put a system in place that enables healthcare professionals to practice with greater confidence and skill and less fear. So when this was bubbling up, one of the first things I did is I called Lewis Blackman's mother, Helen Haskell. And I said, Helen, you know, her son died of failure to rescue. I said, Helen, what do you think of this? I'm going to send you these articles. And you know what her first response was? And this is why we need patients and families to partner with us. Certainly why I needed them. She said, can patients and families call the team? I thought, oh my God. This is what she needed. She needed a workaround, just like some of you sometimes need a workaround the system, because we're all in this together. And so now you see a number of hospitals, not everyone, but University of Pittsburgh, for example, have a provision where patients and families can call the team, because all of you are just too busy. You can't see everything. Can patients and families be the eyes and ears and there are those who say, oh, well, they'll be calling us because the food is cold. That hasn't happened. You know, in the early days at Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we funded some of the first 911 systems around the country back in the 70s. And it, it turns out back then, people were afraid to call 911. <laughs> they didn't want to do it. They, they would kind of, you know, I don't want to call in the Army. And so we're seeing the same thing. We're not seeing the abuse of rapid response systems. I love this quote from W. Edwards Deming. How do we drive out the fear so everyone can work effectively? How do we drive out the fear? And I can only say from the process improvement people that if we can fix broken systems, we can go a long way to taking out the reasons why systems break down, why people are harmed, and so people can practice with less fear. And I will say it's a journey. We had the pleasure of working uh, with Institute for Healthcare Improvement and the uh, Cincinnati Children's Hospital. It was in the forefront of really trying to work on quality and safety, but it is a journey. And they were working for at least seven or eight years. And finally, they were considering bringing in engineers who understand process, who understand systems, to work in their organizations. They look at work in a different way. I think it's enormously valuable what they observe. And they had the courage to allow these engineers to be interviewed. And it was in Forbes or Fortune magazine. And these engineers were allowed to say how surprised they were at how healthcare has been allowed to just grow and expand without the systems thinking that other industries have, where we can account for the fact that we are human and build systems around the fact of our humanity that we are going to make mistakes, that this is a complex life and death enterprise. So let's account for the fact that we're human and put those systems in place. I've been, uh, work, I worked on a book on healthcare reform called The Battle Over Healthcare. And for those of you who are nurses, I wrote a chapter, uh, if only there were iPhones, because I've talked to so many nurses. And this is why the human factors work that you're doing here is so important. That if you remember when the iPhone 4 came out and there was a little glitch with the antenna? Remember that? And all hell broke loose? People were complaining, oh my God, they couldn't use their phones. You ever talk to nurses working in the, at the bedside and how stuff doesn't work and how frequently it doesn't work? I remember looking at these colleague infusion pumps, and for years and years and years, the FDA was trying to get them out of the market. The manufacturer would not fix known defects. People were dying because of these defects. So we have a lot of stuff that gets in the 
in what I call the healthcare cockpit that would never be allowed in the equivalent of the airline cockpit. It's not tested for human interaction. It's not tested for interoperability. The work of patient safety allows us to open this up and say, why are we doing it this way and can we do it better? What can human factors teach us and how can we make sure we test every piece of equipment before it ends up on the floor? And test it, is it really ready for prime time? You know, the barcode scanners, you can look in the literature, 15% of the time they don't work. The labels are wrinkled, and so nurses do a workaround. There's a reason nurses do the workarounds. Those cows on wheels, you know, they're heavy. They lose connectivity. And so, but we keep plowing more stuff in without testing it. How do we kind of hold the line here? This is the opportunity that patient safety brings to us to ask these questions. Because the ultimate point is how do we make care safer? Because nurses are too busy. The, you know, the, pa the machines have become the patient. And that's why we've almost designed communication out of healthcare because we've made it so complex. The other uh, place where I think I know that patients have made a powerful difference in patient safety is around hospital acquired infections. Uh, you know the state about the number of people who are affected by infections every year. Every data points a person. I came to understand the power of what happens when preventable infections occur. When I met the mother of this woman, uh, the woman's uh, mother's name is Diana. She um, had a history of gallstones, and one day, she, Sunday, it was Palm Sunday, she was in church, and she had a, an attack, and it was very painful. She was four months pregnant. And so her parents were with her, and they drove her to the nearest hospital. And to make a long story short, uh, she had uh, gallbladder surgery, laparoscopically. And afterwards, she began to feel feverish, pain around the site. You know where this is going. She reported these symptoms. They were not tended to for about eight or nine days. She did have follow-up surgery by the same surgeon. Her mother didn't want that. Her instinct was saying we should have a different surgeon. If you look in the literature, <laughs> it says the repair surgery should, is better done by more of an expert, not the original surgeon. You have better outcomes. Anyway, in the course of her four, subsequent four-month stay in the hospital, she acquired a central line infection. She lost about 40 or 50 pounds. And at eight months, uh, the physician said, let's, you know, let's go ahead and deliver this baby. And her beautiful daughter was born healthy. But her mother couldn't withstand the onslaught, and she died two days after this picture the first and only time she held her daughter. So when I talk to medical students and residents, you know, why should you wash your hands and why we have checklists, this is it. And her mother was, her mother now is raising her granddaughter. It was, she was beyond despair. And what do you do? There's a whole community of people that I discovered. So I somehow I met her and she was, you know, really, it, literally, wit's end. And so I called up Helen Haskell. I said, Helen, you're a mom. You need to talk to this other mother. And you know, uh, this uh, Diana used to be in theater up in Portland, Oregon. And um, in honor of her daughter, Diana's mother, she wrote a play. And to know, to give you a sense of this other world that is just so extraordinary that doesn't come out in the light of you know, our public discourse. You know what this play was about? It was about the children who've died from preventable health care harm. And they're in heaven talking to each other. That's what the play was about. Patients have, for me, have made the invisible visible. And I remember David Leach, who was head of the ACGME once, said, you know, sometimes for us to move, it has to hurt. It has to hurt. And we wake ourselves up. But then we need knowledge to figure out how do we fix these things. And that's why we have experts, process improvement people, systems people, 
to help us account for the fact that we are human so we can do it better. For me, these experiences have been a gift of realization. It's a very tough gift to receive, but they've opened my mind and they have opened my heart and they've opened my brain to say, how do we do it differently? How do we do it better? And we can fix this. You know, ventilator-associated pneumonia. Have you, you all reduced ventilator-associated pneumonia in your hospitals? We can fix this stuff, right? Has the number of codes gone down in your hospitals? And why is that happening? Because you put a system in place, so that means that people are alive today that may not have been alive because of what you have done, because you've put systems in place that account for the fact that we are human. That's the beauty of it. You know, on a different note, uh, this is a couple who I had the pleasure of meeting. Um, uh, they're from Oregon, and uh, Dee Dee and Tom Vallier. And Tom was up on his roof one day cleaning his gutters, and he fell off. He should have hired somebody to do the job. <laughs> he hurt his back, and he broke his leg, and he went to the hospital. And he, he said, oh, you'd probably be here, you know, two or three days. Well, it turns out he got three different infections. And this was about six or seven years ago before infections were really on our radar. And so his wife was so concerned um, that her husband wasn't getting the care that he needed. You know what she did? She actually, went, she actually went online and took a course, at the un online course at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, an epidemiology course on these infections, and she contacted physician leaders who worked at the CDC present and prior to find out what is the best treatment for the infections that her husband had. She had to do that for her, the small hospital where her husband was being taken care of on the West Coast. And the beauty of talking to patients, so anyway, his two to three hospital, day hospital stay turned into months. And when his insurance ran out, he went home. He was sent home. And then the bills started coming. And his wife was just, and she was taking care of her husband home. He had this big hole in his chest. She said, you could see his spine. And then the bills started coming. And she said, I couldn't bear it. And she said, I, did, I couldn't open them. I just put them in a box in the basement. And here's what she said that opened my mind to what, we, what we've been doing in healthcare all along that we've never seen. Here's what she said. Isn't that amazing that we've been doing that? So if I'm driving a car, if I drove over here this morning and I hit somebody on the beltway, my fault, but I send them a bill. We've been doing that. Wow, why are we doing that? Is that how we really want to do it? Or can we do it differently? This is what I learned from being in dialogue. And not every patient our family member is the right person to engage in the work of improving quality and safety. Some people are just not ready for it. You need people who are probably have a certain education level, certain life experience, have been able to process whatever happened, and are prepared to come to work, to partner. And they're out there. And sometimes, as Dave said, you just have to pick up the phone. As I did, all these people, I just picked up the phone, didn't know them from Adam. And then look what you start. And so, you know, it was these patient voices uh, back in 2004. There were, you know, hundreds and eventually now thousands of people who started telling their stories online about hospital acquired infections. That was sort of invisible. And they got, you know, laws passed. I'm sure they were a pain in the neck for you, but they got laws passed saying we have to have some sort of public reporting on all these infections because, you know, you shouldn't go in the hospital and get sicker. And they had Democrats and Republicans who came together. I remember down in South Carolina, there was a, a white evangelical Republican and an African-American Democratic minister who got together and got legislation passed saying, you know, we really should have some accountability here so you know where this is coming from. And so now we have solutions. We have ways to try to manage this. We have, we're checklists. They're not perfect, but we, we're getting there. And Medicare payment policy is changing. So now we're seeing more and more hospitals that are actually bringing thoughtful patients into their work together around safety and quality. Dana-Farber, Cincinnati Children's, 
Geisinger. I remember I visited Geisinger Health System, and they had a woman whose dad had an adverse event. And they made a little film about that event, and they showed it to the staff. She's an engineer by training, and she's part of their quality committee, and she makes a wonderful contribution to their work. Very dispassionate, thoughtful, but she brings a presence and that gift of realization. A lot of questions come up about where do you find patients to partner with? What's the work that we want to do together? How do we work together? Our use of language. You know, we've got to all kind of figure this out, but you know what? The good news is we're figuring it out. And there are others who've gone before who've helped lead the way and who can help teach us how to do that. Just as a, an aside and almost coming full circle for the palliative care work, one place for improvement is informed consent. I know this is a challenge for a whole lot of reasons. I won't go into it. But is consent really informed? Are patients aware of their treatment options, benefits, and risks? How can we make that better? You know, a family member said, you know, for elective procedures, why don't, you just, why don't they just give us the form like a week in advance so we can take it home? But then that triggers the conversation. Often there's not enough time in a busy clinical setting to answer all those questions, right? How do we fix that? There has to be a fix to it. And I believe working together, we can fix these things. And so I wrote a book on overuse. You know, it was really, again, talking to patients. And there's a story in the book, The Treatment Trap. Lewis Blackman died of failure to rescue. After that, has, we've gone through all of that. His mother said, well, you know, there's another part B to his story. And I said, oh, no, what's that? I won't go into it, but all I'll say is patients and families are often not informed of their treatment options, the benefits and risks. And we know from the literature that when they are informed of those options and their risks and benefits in a thoughtful, objective way, they tend to choose less intensive, less invasive procedures. They go a different route. Now, for some, you know, that want to, some places don't want to lose revenue. But if we're sincere about informed consent and honoring patients' preferences and values, that's what we'll do. So I'll close on a sort of note of inspiration. I took um, liberty with a quote from Mahatma Gandhi. I don't think he would mind. A patient is the most important visitor on our premises. He is not dependent on us. We are dependent on him. He is not an interruption in our work. He is the purpose of it. He is not an outsider in our business. He is part of it. We are not doing him a favor by serving him. He is doing us a favor by giving us the opportunity to serve him. Thank you for your service to all the patients who come to you in need of health and healing. Thank you for all you do to keep them safe. And thank you for all that you will do to make care better and safer for everybody that comes to you in need of health and healing. Steve. I've worked with pretty well. I really okay. want to commend David Rosner. This is a, back in the 60s and 70s, business recognized that which was male dominated, that the conversation in business rooms and in boardrooms changed dramatically if they brought women into the conversation. The whole filter on how business moved, everything changed. And in the last decade, through the tremendous work that you've done, Rosemary, what Dave has done to raise heightened awareness about this, the whole filter and conversation about quality and safety changed because of the perspective and the filter through which you see it. So I think that this is a great conversation and a really right. great starting point for us in terms of where our journey goes. But I, I really do think it changes the whole tenor of how we have a conversation about quality and safety. It also adds the piece that I'm really so grateful for is the emotional component of this. You can make this brutally sterile. And I can get down to the fact that we had 14 collapses last week. I had 12 UTIs. I had whatever I had at our hospitals. But if you don't add an emotional component and attachment to it, then it's all for naught. So when you add the sensitivity about showing patient's faces and the connection to it, it changes the entire demeanor and the approach with which we take quality safety. <coughs> I really do commend you again. You know, when, uh, and 
how I learned to do this. When I first started giving talks on Wall of Silence, I would just do narrative. And what was, I found so extraordinary, and this is why we need to all talk to each other and learn from each other, it was the nurses and the doctors and the risk managers and everybody else saying, they were asking me, well, do you have any pictures? <laughs> you all were asking me for pictures. So the patients were really willing. I mean, you should see the pictures I have in my basement. Because they want to have a voice, and I think we want to find a way to connect with each other. It's a form of healing. Um, and I think we have great opportunity for healing all around for patients and all of you, because you've all seen this stuff, right? It's an opportunity for healing. And as I said earlier, there's a great, you know, the Gandhi movie, my favorite scene is, you know, a guy comes up to him, and they're in the middle of all this, you know, battle, and, and Gandhi said, I know a way out of hell. So I think a lot of this quality and safety work is through this dialogue, our human understanding of each other, as well as good science, to come to a very different place. Thank you for your comment. Tell, tell me who you are and where you're from. Uh, Steve Evans, I'm the BPMA for uh, at Georgetown. That Jesuit tradition. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it wasn't until I'm older that I understood the value of a liberal education. Uh, other comments, thoughts? Thank you. You have to invite me to come talk to the students. I, I want to come. In the uh, wonderful uh, presentation, in the description and meeting you had with these families, were you able to course back then to the caregivers that were part of the uh, harm and get their feedback about the wall of science, uh, the wall of silence? You know, um, I thought of that. Um, I did not. And the reason was um, where I was coming from, readiness. I think a lot of it was readiness of conversation. So the little boy in the sailor suit, the mother who wrote this beautiful letter, she never got a response. And it, it's not good or bad. It's just this readiness and knowing what do I do and how do I process this? Because you can only imagine how horrible that physician felt. And what I really appreciate, the work that Dave and others have done at University of Illinois, Chicago, um, and University of Michigan, we've got to figure out how do we deal with this as professionals and respond to it personally as well as professionally, because it is so hard. Um, so I did not do that. I thought of it. But it just, at that moment in place, and even now, sometimes it takes 10 years and there are some patients that have tried to reconnect. But it's so powerful and so poignant and painful. We've got to create those spaces, and it has happened, and it's incredible. But it takes a lot of courage and other things. So no, I did not, but that's the kind of thing. The best places I've seen in hospitals, what they've done is they bring patients who've been involved in adverse events and a physician taking care of them and have that dialogue in front of their colleagues. That's, though, very rare. But thank you for your question. It's a really important one. Thank you. I'll echo the compliments on an excellent presentation. Is there a parallel effort going around on what you're doing to sit down with the nurse who was involved, the person who might get fired or prosecuted or both or sued for something that perhaps they didn't have any harm in mind to do or any blame, any liability, uh, it seems like they could be an overlooked and very valuable resource if we would take the time. I've heard of ad hoc um, efforts, and uh, but nothing um, formal. Dave, do you, you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, if, um, for those of you that are familiar with the program we put in place at the University of Illinois, in fact it's one of the NQF safe practices, is one of the seven pillars was care for the caregiver. And so the program was built on responding to unanticipated harm and having conversations with patients and families within 15 to 30 minutes of that event happening. Simultaneously, we had a group of 15 caregivers who also were triggered, one of them, to respond to the care team and to be with them within 15 minutes of a harm. And that gets into, and we'll talk a little bit later during lunch, the, the ideas of just culture and how do you create that just culture because from our experience, we found that about 99.8, you know, 9% of caregivers who are involved in harm went to work that morning trying to do good 
and found themselves in a position that all of us would have dreaded and done the same thing, made the same mistake that they did. But we found those people need hugs. Those people need reinforcements. Um, they need to be you know, really shown that we are behind them. And if you don't, you see things like the Seattle Children's nurse who committed suicide two days after the fact. You see cases like Julie Tao up in Wisconsin who was not only fired after a mistake, but then filed charges against her so the hospital could get off the medical malpractice claim. It destroys culture. That said, we found, because we had these full disclosure programs at University of Illinois, if you're going to ask patients and families to forgive you when one of these horrendous mistakes happens because it's system process and it's teams, um, you've also got to show them that you're accountable when somebody knowingly violates safe policies and procedures for their own benefits. Because many times in those conversations after these events, and Larry knows this better than I do, who's going to get fired? Who's going to be accountable for harming my family member, for harming me? And you have to have those meaningful conversations. You've got to be able to share with them that this wasn't an individual's fault. This was all of our faults. In fact, many times we said, if anything, this was my fault because I didn't protect my people, giving them the tools in the field to make that happen. If they're going to believe you there, you've got to be accountable for those times where you go, whoa, this was not what we stand for. And at University of Illinois, as Rosemary knows, we asked for the resignation of the top revenue generator in our hospital within 24 hours. On the cover of Chicago Magazine as one of the top surgeons in the city of Chicago, that took a little guts on our board of directors. You, I could tell you, you know, do we start with the next person? Do we, you know, no, you, you've got to show that this is what we stand for. And they did it. And it, it, the culture in the organization was amazing. So it, you need to support your care team, too. You know, um, Dave didn't ask me to say this, but I will uh, say it. Um, I, when I wrote Wall of Silence and said, you know, how can we do this different, I haven't found a place that has gone as deep and as wide in trying to do the right thing on just culture than what Dave and his colleagues did at UIC, both for patients and for families. I can't tell you how many, we have to learn, and that just culture brings a framework of, so you're with a group of nurses, as I was a couple months ago, and during the break a nurse was taking a cell phone call from her institution saying there was a medication error, and the first question was, well, who did it? What did they do wrong? Wrong question. How do we change how we think, what we say, and what we do that incorporates a just culture? And nobody's perfect at it, but at least we have a roadmap of where to go. And people will want to come to work that's with that kind of culture in place with less fear and less agony as they're you know, driving into the parking lot and locking their car. That's what we need to do. And I'm hopeful that, Dave, what you did at UIC, that you can bring here, especially to my alma mater, Georgetown, and every other place. You know, yeah, absolutely. yeah it's, it would be really wonder wonderful if you could do that. It's not an easy road, but I'll tell you, once you're there, and if you talk to people who are there, they will never, ever want to go back to the way it was. <coughs> Just real quick, real quick. First of all, that was wonderful. I'm Larry Smith. I run the uh, malpractice program. <laughs> <I'm Larry Smith. laughs> and the reason I wanted to get up is just to say that um, one of the nice things about what David introduced this, um, this uh, meeting uh, with was the sense that we're all together, risk managers, quality assurance folks, process improvement folks, um, the, uh, the folks who are working in um, Terry Fairbanks' uh, shop trying to improve uh, the, uh, the engineering of healthcare. And um, everything you said today, you hit a lot of the, the issues that affect us. Is it um, the patients that we see who become the claimants that are in our lawsuits are the same patients you talked to who were suffering because of the uh, errors that they uh, suffered. And their expressions to us are often the same as they were to you. Oh, which is I'm not suing because I want money. I'm suing because I want to know what happened. I want to know that somebody uh, else won't suffer the same harm. So it really is, um, I think, important to recognize that there is nothing different about what we do in risk management or in quality or in safety. We're all doing the same thing, and the goals can be absolutely aligned because of that. So I really want to thank you for tying this together. Well, uh, just a quick point on that. Um, 
you know, there are always going to be uh, people who want to look for deep pockets. In life, there will always be those kind of people. But the reality is, every, all these people I talk to, and they may not be represented, but all the people I talk to, the last place they wanted to be was hanging around a bunch of lawyers. The last place they wanted to be was going into courtrooms. It was emotionally, you know, it takes away from their health. They're trying to get better. That's the last place they want to be. So, but what we've done too often in healthcare is like giving people keys to the car to go to the lawyer, paying them for cab fare to go to the lawyer's office the way we've treated them. So can we do it differently? And then I hope, and maybe it's, you will know best, can you develop enough of inoculation, enough of a reputation in your communities that you've done it, that you'll do the right thing? That when they try to come after you, the lawyers know that you are inoculated to some degree because you are upstanding, do it the right way approach. That, that would be a great vision to strive for. Thank you.